Um, but what I wanted to, to do today to kick off this session was talk a little bit about this new paradigm for waste management associated with this global nuclear renaissance where what we're really seeing is changes, fundamental changes in the, the approach that we need to be taking towards management of nuclear waste. And by nuclear waste, I, I use that term broadly. Uh, it's, it, waste is probably a, a misnomer for many of the things that, that we consider waste because they certainly are assets of, of real value to, to somebody that wants them. But it's, it's like my kids with the Pokemon cards. You know, Pokemon cards are only worth what they're telling you they're worth on the web if somebody wants to buy them. Uh, so waste is waste until somebody wants to buy it and then it becomes an asset. Um, but really, what, what I want to talk about is, just to set it up a little bit, is where this nuclear renaissance is going. And the nuclear renaissance is something that we've heard about over the past, oh, five years or so with, uh, with increasing, uh, increasing emphasis, but it's something that hasn't really jumped out. It's been, it's been slow to develop and it's, uh, it's still kind of slow to develop. And portions of this are the, just the sheer cost of, of what it takes to, uh, to build a nu nuclear power plant. And that's certainly been impacted by the global uh, financial situ situation. But, but people are really beginning to look at, at nuclear as a, a must contribute uh, to the, the green and renewable energy. And if you, uh, if you look at the, the draft language from the bill that Senator Graham, the senior senator from the great state of South Carolina, where I'm from, ha has just introduced. Um, it considers nuclear, it counts nuclear as a renewable energy, which is a real game changer. Uh, now that's got a long way to go through the, uh, through the halls of, of Congress and, and through the president, but considering nuclear as, as both uh, green and renewable, is certainly is good for the industry. But there's, there's several things too that, that people are looking at with this nuclear renaissance and that is not only adding uh, megawatts of electricity to the grid, grid uh, from economically attractive reactor power systems but also providing BTUs of, of process heat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the roadmap that the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy is putting together and show you how that who that is a, another avenue for, for nuclear penetration into uh, a green market. And specifically when we talk about uh, BTUs of process heat, we're looking at nuclear cogeneration uh, and process heats that are closely coupled to some of the things we heard about yesterday in uh, the biofuels and biogeneration uh, to provide that process heat for those. Now all that's going to be in a, done in a way that addresses what are the traditional barriers to nuclear energy implementation. Uh, first and foremost is safety, or I highlight perception there, thereof. All the statistics uh, you know, will tell you, if you look at them and you're not even an expert at statistics, they'll tell you that nuclear is a very, very safe industry. Um, but it's the perception that's out there that nuclear isn't safe. Uh, capital cost. There's, there's little doubt that the, the upfront capital cost is a barrier to increase use of, of uh, nuclear energy, particularly in countries that um, don't have the, the strong utility structure and don't have a, a federal loan guarantee program. Uh, an estimated cost of a, a new light water reactor system built slightly bigger than the ones that are operating now in the U.S. is, is somewhere north of five billion dollars per unit. So it's not something that a, a utility, a smaller utility that has a market cap of, you know, five to ten billion dollars can easily bite off. And that's why you see the importance of these loan guarantees. Uh, proliferation of, of nuclear materials, both in the form of, of spent nuclear fuel or used nuclear fuel and separated nuclear materials um, for uh, re resulting from reprocessing of, of spent fuel. And then waste management, sustainable fuel cycles, dealing with the, the waste, the long-lived radioisotopes, the waste that comes, comes out of it. We, we find ourselves in kind of a, a peculiar situation. Um, 
Nuclear is certainly uh, an, an energy source that gets typically associated with the more conservative leaning uh, administrations. You, there's, no, there's no such thing as a Democratic or a, or a Republican power source, but it's typically been the, the Republicans uh, that have, have been strong proponents of the nuclear, nuclear uh, industry. So it's kind of an interesting, um, almost a dichotomy of where we are, that a, a nuclear renaissance stalled under eight years of Republican administration that finds itself really getting kick-started uh, with a under, under Democratic in, administration. And the reasons for this, and I've got plenty of slides that I, I took out of this talk, there is no way, and I don't care what anybody says, there is no way the administration can meet its objectives for greenhouse gas elimination or re reduce dependence on foreign oil without a growth in the nuclear sector. You can, you can run the, the scenarios any way you want. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's almost a game of liar's poker. The, we heard some of this yesterday. The solar guys will tell you that solar can solve all the world's problems if we cover up the state of Kansas with solar panels. Um, the wind guys will tell you that wind can solve all of our domestic problems if we you know, all install a windmill on the top of our house and we figure out ways to get all that power to the grid that people can use. Uh, but it, it, really is, it really is pretty straightforward. If you run through the analyses, even in a conservative case, nuclear is going to continue to, to you know, be at least 20% of our domestic energy um, contributor. And that 20% gives us about 70 plus percent of non-carbon emitting, uh, non emitting energy at this point. But these were a couple of uh, <clears throat> very, very uh, supportive statements. The, the top one is very recently made, which was a surprise to, to many of us. Certainly the president doesn't consult me when he's writing the State of the Union, but as I was watching it, it's, it's really atypical for a Democratic president to, to go out on a, a limb against certain portions of his constituency which really don't support nuclear in such a public setting. But he clearly did that. And uh, there's, there's some key words there, and that's first safe and, and clean uh, nuclear power. Uh, but safe is the one that, that gets people. Um, and then. Uh, Secretary Chu at the ANS meeting last fall did the same thing and committed to restarting the nuclear industry. So there really is a support in Congress. And if you look at the, uh, what's coming out of the US DOE nuclear energy program, you, you see that support. Uh, particularly if you look at the, the fiscal 2011 request, which uh, language just came out on uh, the, the first Monday in February, it's very supportive of nuclear. And you see some rather substantial growth in nuclear research R&D. Uh, but the overall US nuclear energy program consists of what, what are being called five uh, imperatives by um, Assistant Secretary Miller. The, the first one, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about all five of these because I, even for the audience that's familiar with these, uh, with the nuclear business, I don't think you're all that familiar with this roadmap that really is just kind of working its way through the the halls of the Forrestal building and will be become public very, very shortly. And a lot of these don't relate to waste management, so I'll skip through them rel relatively quickly. But there are five main imperatives. Graphically, they, they kind of look like this, that DOE, Nuclear Energy Mission, is, is providing both electricity and process heat. So you got megawatts electric and BTUs. But the five imperatives are, first and foremost, extend the life of the existing fleet. And we heard yesterday morning from Steve Zinkel's presentation about how important this is, that most of the license applications have, have been extended, uh, many towards 60 years, but there's also a light water reactor sustainability program that some people refer to as life after 60. So you will begin to see uh, an emphasis on continuing to support these, uh, these existing fleet like I said, in the United States, there's 104 reactors, something that a lot of people aren't, aren't aware of, that do provide us 20% of our, of our electrical. In a state like South Carolina, which isn't very, um, which isn't very advantageous for either solar or wind, uh, we have a lot of sun, but it's filtered by a lot of humidity, and we just don't have that much wind. We get about 50% of our electricity is generated by nuclear, so it's, it's part of that 
and so it's really or a diversified energy portfolio that becomes very important in certain countries. Uh, the second imperative that you'll see right here that contributes to both electricity and, and BTUs for industrial and transportation sectors is enabling new builds. Okay, enabling new construction, new reactor construction, whether that's the, uh, the large um, plants that you are hearing constructed by some of the major utilities or small modular reactors that are getting more and more important. Uh, but enabling those in a way that is, is cheap, uh, cheap, safe, and, uh, and effective. And that will imply dealing with the waste that comes out. So you'll see that underneath. Uh, the third imperative is, is simply enabling a transformation industri of industrial and transportation sectors to provide the, the process heat that is necessary to develop some of these fuel sources that will enable us to, to uh, eliminate some of our dependence on, on foreign generated oil. Uh, so you'll see that's primarily from a BTU, and I'll talk some about this. This is, you can just imagine a, a modular high temperature gas cooled reactor or some type of high temperature reactor there. Uh, underlying that is one that we'll, we'll talk about today, uh, Imperative 4, which is we, we, we worked pretty hard trying to determine how to, how to keep this relatively broad, but also, uh, also to, to, to really point out that you do need to think of the fuel cycle from beginning to end. So we call this uh, developing sustainable fuel cycles, and I'll, I'll talk some, I'll talk quite a bit about this and, and what it means. And then the fifth imperative that underlies all of these is manage the proliferation risk. The risk associated with nuclear materials or, or spent nuclear fuel getting into, into the wrong hands or place that, that you don't want it. And what we've tried to outline, and you'll see this when the, uh, the, the roadmap and its associated implementation plans become publicly available as a science-based program that answers the long-term questions but also pushes towards results. It's not just R&D for the sake of R&D. There is an industry that we're trying to support. Uh, Steve showed a lot of this yesterday in his talk. Um, the, the existing reactors are, are a remar remarkable uh, set of technology and, and uh, combinations of technology that provide remarkable of value to the rate payer and to the utilities. They are, especially now that they've been operating for, for 20 plus years, the assets are fully depreciated, they're fully paid off, but they're running at 90% efficiency. They are the ultimate cash cow for a utility and they stay on 24 seven. Uh, doesn't matter if the wind's blowing or the sun is shining, they are really uh, they are really there. But what we're, what we're talking about here is, is, you know, this is a bridge to a low carbon future. Uh, looking at these existing plants and their capability as a bridge to get to the point where solar and other renewables and, and things that maybe we haven't even talk, uh, talk, uh, talked about, uh, like fusion, um, which is only 50 years away. By the way, fit fusion is it? It's been 50 years away for the last 30 years, but it's still only 50 years away. Uh, but essentially, what we're talking about is extending the life beyond 60 years. This is life after 60, and Steve talked about most of these. Enable power up rates. Enable the reactors to get more power, to get more bang from the current bunk, buck, and then manage spent nuclear fuel inventories. And this means enabling power up means going to higher and higher levels of burn up. Uh, on the same level of uranium enrichment that, that you have. Um, and it's, you know, there's a, there's a huge, fr and the way I look at it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, there's a, a pretty good analogy, but then managing the spent nuclear fuel inventory. This is where things like the, the demise or the purported demise of, of Yucca Mountain, you know, may become problematic because there's still a lot of spent nuclear fuel uh, that needs to be managed at some point, and there's still a lot of spent nuclear fuel, used nuclear fuel that's being generated every year. Um, Steve talked a lot about this in his uh, opening uh, tutorial session yesterday, so I won't talk very much about it, but there's a lot of, uh, of materials related work here in enabling this aging fleet to continue for another 30 years. Um, I want to point out though that this waste legacy is the most critical issue 
for nuclear energy in terms of public perception and, and acceptance. You, you see very little outside the nuclear press um, unless you're very closely located next to a, a nuclear plant. When they, when they find a crack in a heat exchanger or they find a little, uh, an increased level of tritium in a groundwater well, you just don't hear about that. But what you do hear about in a in a, a lot of the press is the, the waste legacy and what are we going to do with that waste legacy. That's the kind of thing that, that the popular press gravitates to. So it is something that those of us in this room will have to deal with. Um, I want to look at, you know, very quickly go through these, this second imperative which is improve the affordability of nuclear power and enable new builds. You now, first and foremost, to eliminate some of the financial risk, and we just saw last week the, the president himself actually announced the, the first loan guarantee, $8 billion of what will be $54 billion in loan guarantees in the FY11 budget uh, for the two units that are being built by Southern Company in uh, Plant Vogel in, in uh, Georgia, right across the river from us at Savannah River. Uh, partnering with the NRC, to develop analyses, ways to do the licensing process faster and better. And then developing some uh, affordable and transitional systems. You'll, you'll hear about um, affordable light water reactors, small and modular reactors, some Gen 4 power systems, and then some transitional type LWRs. Uh, things that are actually licensed for 100 plus years, if you can imagine. Uh, but here's the, the big one, this 25% reduction in capital cost per kilowatt hour and their operating cost. Uh, all the while developing significantly lower spent nuclear fuel volumes and spent nuclear fuel actinide content, which are some of the things that contribute to the the, uh, the difficulty there. And then kind of a blank sheet of paper for some of the balance of plant and system architectures. Uh, this, this basically shows, you know, what's happening across the, the world. There has been some slowdown to global financial issue, uh, uh, due to global financial issues, but uh, really there are 436 operating reactors across the world right now, something that a lot of the press and a lot of the public certainly doesn't know. 43 under construction, 106 planned or ordered, and another 266 proposed. In the United States, there's some 13 to 15 applications being looked at by the NRC. But if you look at some of these emerging economies down here, particularly China and India and other places, Sub-Saharan Africa, this is happening now and we're not going to stop it. So, you know, it's up to us to kind of work with the international community on some of these frameworks for proliferation resistant and waste management in order to provide, you know, a safe, uh, um, a safe nuclear industry. Okay, the third imperative is kind of this penetration of nuclear into, into new markets, non-traditional markets, not associated with, with megawatts of electricity, but more associated with providing uh, heat to transportation and industrial sectors to uh, enable this transition away from fossil fuels. Um, if you look at the scenario analysis, there's, there's little doubt that this sector is huge when it comes to eliminating CO2 emissions. And, and uh, Yet Ming Chang yesterday in his, his presentation really showed when he was talking about electric and hybrid electric and and plug-in electric vehicles that you, you also have to consider the CO2 uh, component from the generation of the electricity that powers it. And that's something that a lot of people don't think about. They, th they figure, you know, just plugging an electric car into the wall will help solve the, the CO2 emission problem. And it does, but you're also, you're also increasing the demand for electrical energy, much of which is coming from fossil fuel sources. So unless you're getting that, that electricity from something like a, a nuclear reactor that does, or a, a solar array that doesn't generate these CO2, you've only, you've only gone this far. Uh, but essentially to, to go after this, what is a fairly big contributor to, to CO2 emissions, and enable sin fuels, electric vehicles, hydrogen power vehicles, et cetera. Um, so this is just very quickly some non-traditional applications of, of nuclear energy. And just think about most of them as is take, taking the heat from uh, the nuclear, nuclear reaction and applying it to some of these processes that use uh, very, very large quantities of process heat. 
Okay, I'm going to skip the, the fourth one and go right to the fifth one because I want to spend a little bit of time for this audience talking about the waste management. Uh, but the fifth one is a sure proliferation risk is not an opt obstacle to nuclear power deployment. A and again, this is one of the, uh, one of the things that we, we spent a lot of time and, and talked a lot about. How do you, how do you phrase this uh, imperative such that it, it means something to people but it doesn't over, oversell the risk associated with proliferation? And, and part of the difficulty is there's no metrics on proliferation ri risk. It's a really quantitative, or qualitative, excuse me, and that's probably an oversell, qualitative assessment. Um, I joke that the, you know, the way they hire people that think about proliferation risks is they, they go to the, the local psychiatrist and they ask them to identify their most paranoid patient and then they make them the d director of nuclear nonproliferation. It's, uh, if you looked at some of these scenarios, you'd be amazed. Uh, but so we're really trying to establish some metrics for these uh, to characterize the technology systems and fuel cycles so that you can actually compare them uh, together. And then to, to look at intrinsic reactor fuel and fuel cycle attributes where possible that discourage uh, proliferation. There's lots of things that you can do and things that have been talked about for a long time like in the fuels uh, business of inert matrix fuels and things like this that, that help manage plutonium. And then finally enable and build that consensus. Okay, so let the, what, what I want to spend the rest of the time on, and I think I have about 10 minutes or so, is this sustainable fuel cycles. Um, so it's a, it's a very complicated approach and something that lots of people in this room have worked for most, if not all, of their careers on, but it's managing disposition, both the, the LWR used nuclear fuel that we have, but then also working at this assumption that nuclear energy equals a 100,000 year plus waste problem. And, and it really doesn't have to be that way. But develop fuels, reactors, and fuel cycles that produce less spent nuclear fuel and lower the long-lived actinide content. Uh, things that can be done. And then in a fully closed fuel cycle, develop reactors that transmutate uh, the actinide waste that we have and that we will produce. And to again put the, uh, move the, move the bar a little bit. And I'll show you a chart that's often misused uh, on, on what that can mean. But uh, also improve the, the fuel cycle e economics. Um, a lot of this is one of the principal obstacles of closing the fuel cycle. It is not a cheap or short journey to begin the process of reprocessing used nuclear fuel. Uh, it brings with it a, a lot of baggage and certainly a reprocessing facility, uh, no matter where you, where you construct it or who it's constructed by, it's going to be a journey that starts in the billions of dollars and, and goes from there. Uh, but it addresses both the front end and the back end and looking at the uranium management and reuse. And I'm going to talk some about that. Okay, so just about everybody in this room has probably seen this chart in one form or another and it's often misused and, and can be uh, a source of, of conflict and confrontation. But uh, typically when you, when you look at radiotoxicity, if you're looking at relative radiotoxicity, which is one good measure, but it's not the only consideration for disposal. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. But if you look at relative radiotoxicity, where one is natural uranium ore, if you pick a used nuclear fuel that's burned to, say, 50 gigawatt days per metric ton, as Steve pointed out these, uh, yesterday, that these units that only a nuclear engineer could uh, enjoy or embrace something like barns for cross-section, absolutely meaningless. But with five years cooling, Used fuel takes about 300,000, somewhere around 10 to the 6 years to decay back to uh, natural uranium ore. So it is a long-lived long -lived problem. Not something that you can't deal with, but long-lived problem. People have a hard time thinking about hundreds of thousands of years. If you just simply remove the uranium and plutonium, which is a relatively easy proposition uh, using the well-developed Purex process, you're down to something that gets down to natural uranium ore within 10,000 years. If you take out the plutonium, uranium, and the minor actinide, something that we have demonstrated and done before, then you get down to natural uranium ore. You can see it drops very quickly. 
in about 300 years. Well, 300 years is the type of things that we can engineer around. We have buildings, uh, we have facilities in our relatively young country that are 300 years old. So it's something that you can begin to look at. But the framework that's coming out of, of DC right now is, is kind of a, a new framework and a new way of looking at this. Um, so we're, we're looking at, at a progression of options and the, typically what we have in the United States right now is this open or once through fuel cycle where we go through the ore recovering, uh, refining, uh, et cetera, make the fuel, put it in a reactor, extract the electricity or process heat, take the spent nuclear fuel out and sometime or another uh, dispose of it somewhere. So there's no recycling or reconditioning of fuel but you've got to look at there really is low uranium utilization. You're only, as, as uh, was pointed out yesterday uh, by Steve, you're only, you're only extracting a percent or so of the intrinsic energy value out of that uranium. Um, I'll step down here first. This is the fully closed fuel cycle that many of us are, have been working on and have thought about for years and years and years. And it's the front end is still the same. You take the fuel in the reactor, you extract the electricity and process heat, but you do a, a, a separations process, a, a, a typical Purex or Urex or some suite of separations processes to remove the uranium, plutonium, minor actinides, etc., and you send those back into the process as fuel. So you take the uranium, you re-enrich it, re -enrich it if you have to. You take the minor actinides and send those to different types of reactors such as a burner reactor. So you're only disposing of a, a small fraction of, of process waste. <clears throat> the problem is this has multiple reprocessing steps and transmutation of actinides. That's code for fast reactor systems. Okay, and then, but it does give you complete uranium utilization. This new one that's been talked about is modified open. And if you put a gun to my head and tell, told me to define modified open fuel cycle right now, I'd just tell you to pull the trigger because I can't do it. Um, but essentially everything starts out the same. You send it to the reactor, extract your electricity or process heat. But then before the fuel goes to geological disposal, you do something to it so that you can get more uranium utilization. Uh, maybe something like the old Dupic process that people have talked about that I'm not gonna get into here. Um, but it, it's somewhere in between. But the, the way I look at it is, I'm gonna borrow Terry's water here. If, if we as a country determine that we're gonna go down this path of continued reliance on nuclear power, then what I say is we, we bought ourselves a bottle of challenge, a bottle of issues, a bottle of risk, a bottle of opportunities. All you're doing when you start dealing with these uh, different frameworks is you're just deciding how you want to allocate that bottle. Okay, so in the once through that we're currently doing, all the risk is at the front end and you're going to run out of uranium resources or in the back end. You know, that you've got somewhere you've got to put the uh, the spent nuclear fuel, the used nuclear fuel. So you've divided that bottle of risk into two main buckets. They may not be of equal size because nobody can tell you how much uranium is left in the world. Um, but the fully closed, you, you move it the other way. You're using all the uranium, so you no longer have to worry about uranium supply, and you've greatly reduced the repository burden so that there, there's little uh, need to build multiple repositories, the repositories you can build uh, don't maybe not be so robust, but you've taken all this bottle of, of challenge and opportunity and you've put it right here in the middle in this separation fuel fabrication and, and reactor. So that's kind of a, a simplistic way of looking at it. It's really a risk transference problem. And when you're getting into project management 101, Risk transference is all about economics, typically, if you're trying to make money. So it's all about, uh, you know, how you balance that and, and how it balances out the financial spreadsheet. <clears throat> but I do real quickly want to go through the option study. We're looking at a lot of different options, and essentially with Yucca Mountain off the table, uh, if it really is off the table, there's a blank sheet in front of the nuclear industry. How are you going to deal with this? So we're looking at a number of different options. Um, 
the things that I already talked about, the waste management, proliferation risk, safety, security, economics and affordability, and to the best of our ability, assigning relatively relative importance to these. But they vary with time, events, and polling groups, uh, depending on, on the public opinion. Uh, but we're trying to develop some qualitative and quantitative measures, uh, mainly so we can identify opportunities for R&D where significant differences can be made. And the key observations, um, uh, and I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail because I don't want to bog down this, but uh, any once through approach has limited ability to impact all of these issues. It's just like I said with the, the kind of crude analogy. You know, if you do buy off a once through fuel cycle, you're, you are by definition going to run into uranium utilization uh, resources. And we've seen this over the past decade or so as the price of uranium has gone up uh, significantly. Um, but there are things to do that. For instance, a once through with a fast breeder could su significantly improve uranium use. Um, recycle offers more opportunities for significant impacts. And the, the, the issue here is once you start recycling spent nuclear fuel, it's hard to go part way. So this modified open fuel cycle, it, it's cleverly called fuel treatment here, but once you dissolve or chop up spent nuclear fuel, use nuclear fuel, you might as well reprocess it because you've bought a lot of the problems that you're going to have. Um, but again, uh, only with re continuous recycle that, that fully closed are, are several opportunities created. So, you know, once you start, you really need to almost go all the way uh, to a fully closed fuel cycle. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the technology options because there really are many, but the, the issue here that for this is the benefits strongly depend, to spend on the depend on the disposal option that you take. Uh, with Yucca Mountain, we were really confined because that was monitored retrievable storage. If we go to a salt type repository or something else, there's lots of different things. And some certain, certain things that were important for Yucca Mountain just aren't important at all. Uh, but the bottom line is, no matter how you do this, and this fuel cycle option study, unfortunately, makes it, you know, there's, there's no way to pick uh, one, uh, one technology that fits all. You really got to consider the complete fuel cycle, like I said in that speech. Um, for waste management, only the fission products are really most important for most waste disposal risk. Uh, it, it's these long-lived fission products that really are the issue. So if you can find cheap ways to deal with the rest of them, you know, for, I, I tell people in the environmental management program in DOE, we're spending it's what I call the cesium enigma. We're spending billions of dollars a year worried about cesium. Cesium has a half-life of, of 30 years. Within a, an engineered period, you know, a couple hundred years, cesium's decayed to the point where it's no longer a problem. So it's really not, the return on investment is really small. Uh, but again, I'm going to run through this pretty quickly and, and kind of end here. What we really need to, and this is... Uh, you know, an area where our, our, our late friend Dirk Gombert really had us all thinking, and, and I miss him every single day when I think about this, but thinking about an integrated waste management strategy um, that really does look at the whole waste management picture from the beginning to the end. Uh, certainly, if, if you think about a, a fully open fuel cycle where you go after uranium, you know, there's a reason that some of these uranium from mill tailings and things like that haven't been recovered. The environmental insult associated with mining some of these more obscure deposits of uranium are something that's probably worse for the environment than, than anything else. So it's something that we need to think about. But we still need to work to define waste treatment, waste forms, and disposition pathways. And that's what the remainder of the session will do. Um, regulatory change is always going to be out there. This consider the beneficial reuse or recycle. You know, there's lots of materials that come out, and like I said, uh, it really is one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, waste is only waste unless somebody wants it. Then it becomes a commodity or it becomes a product that people want and it's worth going after. Uh, think of all the, the zirco zircoloy alloys and all the, the stainless steel components and, and, and other exotic metal alloys that go down the 
that go down the repository drain with used nuclear fuel. Uh, if that could be cleaned up, that could be reused. And again, there's a, it's a huge opportunity for collaboration amongst a number of different uh, disciplines and expertise. And really important is we need to figure out how to learn from our previous uh, defense and civilian experience. And that's about it. Probably a little bit longer than I want, but I think I've got time for a couple questions. Yeah? yeah you've spoken about how um, nuclear is now considered renewable. And you've also talked about closing the cycle. Do you see a real openness to new fast readers, seeing that we don't have any in the country right now? Um, again, sure. A lot of people, a, a lot of people would love to have a, uh, a fast breeder, a fast spectrum reactor, reactor available. Question is, who's going to pay for it? Yeah, well, it, that's the ultimate because you can continue to breed uranium, but you know what we've been talking about is not so much a breeder reactor cycle, but a burner, a fast burner reactor to transmutate the actinides. But it, it can be. I mean, we can we can all go back to the the breeder reactor cycles that were talked about well, 30 plus years ago.